group how you doing hey tony so how, how's those emails going tony oh my goodness i'm swamped i got a email all these emails are sent to me but they're all regarding joe cardinal and the first one is from the estate of tiny tim who there the estate is claiming that joe is trying to rip off tiny tim with his hair and I tried to explain, look, I'm not even sure if Joe Cardinal even knows who Tiny Tim is. And if that isn't bad enough, then I got one from the manager of Crystal Gale, the country star, who's saying she and she alone can have the longest hair in show business and for Joe Cardinal to back off. And the other one was from a rep from RuPaul who said, basically, you're looking good, Joe. So, um yeah, I'm dealing with this all afternoon. You're a celebrity, Joe. Well, I'm glad you're there to manage me and buffer me from all this. This is It's tough being a celebrity like this. But, you know, I'm thinking it doesn't have to be just me, you know. I mean, with the accordion skills you have, with all the time you've invested, you're halfway to Weird Al Yankovic, really. If you just kind of went a little bit further, pushed it, kind of embraced the hair and maybe a Hawaiian shirt, you're there, you know. I mean, if you're going to learn kind of an ironic instrument, you might as well try and make a living from it. So just think about it. You, I could be Tiny Tim on stage. You're Weird Al. We just need to, uh, Nico to learn some instrument. Well, you know, fu funny, I actually play with Frankie Yankovic, uh, who's no relation to Weird Al Yankovic, but Frankie Yankovic, America's Polka King. I played the drums. Uh, yeah, okay, yeah, we got to get Nico maybe, maybe tambourine. Nico, you would look good with a tambourine on your hip. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I don't think that's I mean. I don't know. That might be a little too complex. I, I think I could hit things. So maybe, maybe a, some sort of hand drum. How, or bongos. There you go. How yeah. about the triangle? Let's, I was really let's... a big fan of the triangle. <laughs> hey, you know. I said we keep it primitive because I'm I'm a pretty primitive person. So bongos, I think I could do that. Yeah, yeah. Unless Joe can get his hands on a conga drum because that's even bigger. But yeah, bongos is fine. I used to have a pair, but then I lost all that when I <laughs> my drums. I lost it all. Well, is the, is the Polka King still around? Frankie Yankovic died quite a few years ago. Uh, you know, he was a Cleveland guy. He actually technically lived in Euclid, Ohio, you know. But, yeah, he was uh, Cleveland and uh, made it big. Actually appeared on The Tonight Show. And he's one of the guys that, you know, I, I tell people I've actually played with some Grammy winners. And he was a Grammy winner. And ironically if you watch the episode well the one episode i know at least that he was on with the tonight show he had a another he always had what's called a second accordionist the second accordionist was the the better of the of the two and they would do all the fancy runs and stuff in the background and in particular that guy was a, a guy named joey misculin who is still around and also won a grammy and i really got my musical career started uh with joey misculin and uh joey maybe 30 years ago or, or so left Cleveland and went to Nashville, made it big. Um, and he plays uh, with, uh, oh, he played with a lot of groups, but now he, what are they called? Riders in the sky or something. They're like a sons of the pioneer kind of thing. And Joey is a tremendous musician. Uh, he was on the road, <laughs> on the road with Frankie Yankovic when he was 13 years old. He was traveling around the country and people mock polkas, but that was a big, big thing. Polkas were like huge. Think of Lawrence Welk and stuff like that. Well, anyway, yeah. So it's funny that you mentioned Weird Al Yankovic, although I don't know the guy and he's absolutely no uh, relation. 
but Weird Al was pretty funny. You know, just eat it. You know I mean, that? Yeah, it must, have, it must have taken them all of about 10 seconds to think of that rhyme or that <laughs> that pun. Yeah, the parody. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was. Yeah, well, yeah, and that's funny that you talk about like him because the parody music has has been around for a long time. As a matter of fact, in music, they have what's called uh, the real book. OK, is, is one of them there. Basically, it's a it's a book that has just the chord charts uh, of popular tunes at the time, you know, um, jazz mainly. Um, but they also had one that that they wrote parody lyrics for like hit songs of the time. And most of the lyrics were quite <laughs> risque. All right. So Weird Al probably picked up on that and cleaned up the act because none of his lyrics, at least the songs that I heard of them, they were not like dirty. They were pretty good and pretty funny. <laughs> but, you know, speaking of like old timers, like probably no one listening is going to remember, but you are you and I are old enough. Do you, you ever hear Spike Jones records? When oh, yeah. Kid? And this, there's a director now, Spike Jones, in movies, not no relation. No. But, um, but yeah, there was these wacky, you know, um, songs about Hitler and stuff, you know, going mm -hmm. way back. But I remember hearing those jokey records. I mean, I think, I think almost any medium or any art form, like whatever legitimate it is, you know, music, film, literature, there's always going to be someone making satire of it. You know, it's just too easy. There's always a, a way to make money off. Not easy. I shouldn't say that. I think there's an art to it, you know. Uh, but that's just, I think part of the, you know, the human condition is if something comes up and someone has a, some art form, there's someone there who's going to make fun of it, you know, <laughs> and sometimes they do a great job and that's fine. Yeah, it's part of the enjoyment, I think. Yeah. Well, he had a guy, uh, Ishka Bibble and, you know, Spike Jones was, he did a lot of, uh, uh, sound effects too. And, and, but the thing like the things with people like Spike Jones and uh, Weird Al Yankovic, they didn't mean any harm. They didn't, they weren't mean, they weren't mocking, you know, like the original composers or whatever. They were creative. They were funny. It wasn't meant to be cruel. Uh, so yeah, I, I kind of appreciated that, you know, uh, I, I haven't kept, I mean, does Weird Al Yankovic even do anything anymore? I mean, I really haven't followed him in years. I think he's going to run for office. At least he should. Nowadays. <laughs> okay. <laughs> What office is he running? Where does he even live? I don't know, but I think he could have a pretty good showing these days. Honestly, I, I think it's up for grabs. I think maybe I'm just projecting what I'm my hopes and wishes, but. Well, you're getting hair like him too. I mean, Joe, you're, you know, you're making the move to the big time. Okay. I don't want to step into your territory. I don't want to, like I said, the, the accordion, the wacky instruments, that's you. So I think you should oh. go for that. I mean, I, I've got the hair really you put us together. We're Weird Al Yankovic, really, we, the two yeah. of us together. So we need to, yeah, I'll, I'll focus on the Tiny Tim skill set, you know, get a ukulele. So well, you play the bass probably as good as you play the ukulele. It should be easy for you to make the transition, right? True. If you only need to know two, three chords, like what our songs are, that's all. You, it's not hard. Yeah, right. Okay, well, we can do something. And we, like I said, we're going to get Nico started quickly on the bongos. Okay. Maybe watch some old reruns of Viola of Lucy, you know, because Ricky Ricardo played the bongos and the congas and stuff. So well, he's definitely got the beatnik beard going. So I like that. I think he kind of, he's got that going for him. So I think that's the right move for him. Yeah. That's, that's definitely my flavor. The bongos. I want to teach you some nice jazz jargon too, man. So you could talk like a hip cat, man. You know, you're going to be like, too bad they don't have record stores around anymore you know uh you i man three weeks with me with the with the lingo and the way you look nico man you could go anywhere and the music would stop i'm telling you because they'd be like man this is one cool cat <laughs> so it'll be like and it's great it's nice that he brought his grandfather along you're referring to me right <laughs> yes that's the beauty of being virtual you know, but I still virtually hate you. Um, you know, we forgot. We totally jumped into this being the professionals that we are. And we didn't ask our vast listening audience to make sure that they hit subscribe. Hit the yeah. like button. Keep hit going. the like. Yeah. Hit that like button. Hit that subscribe button. You know, ring that bell. There's a bell on there that you got to ring for notifications. And 
If you guys have been paying attention, maybe you haven't. If you haven't done one of those three things, this week we launched, or I launched, and Joe does all the uploading and answers all the questions, I guess. My my three times a week, it's going to try to be uh, my little five-minute or so video clips filmed right here. Um, we did it, um, let's see, Monday, well, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. That's the, that's the plan. That's what we're shooting for, but I'm not making any promises that it'll always be Monday, Wednesday, and Friday because a little behind the scenes thing, even though it's maybe roughly a five minute video, um, there's a lot more to it than that. It's the planning of it. And then it's the editing and so on. And, uh, it, it ends up becoming a little bit more than five minutes. So it's, it's a, it's a all, all day thing. Hey, it looks like we lost me for some reason or another here. Yeah. All of a sudden things got a lot better looking on. I know. Well, podcast. keep talking. We'll find out what's going on. Keep on talking guys. Um, so well, I guess a good question is if you're doing these short videos, I think, you know, if people are, um, you know, besides emailing, emailing about me and my, you know, ongoing appearance issues, uh, if they have questions for Tony that they want answered, this would be a great time. Like if you, there's any like technique questions or, you know, self-defense questions that you want Tony to answer, definitely reach out, give us more uh, subject matter to, if you need a long form question, maybe we'll cover it here. Uh, but if it's something that Tony can jump on real quickly, um, that's something, yeah, that would be perfect for these little segments that are coming out. The other thing that's kind of cool uh, for people who are uh, kind of curious about our podcast or maybe just new to it is we're going to start going through and releasing kind of uh, little clips from our podcast so you can get kind of a condensed version, a little preview of some of the better conversations we've had. So it's all a lot of exciting content, I think, that we're going to have out there. So stay tuned. Um, still don't have Tony with us, so um let's see what else can we talk about well, we've covered so poka today, today <laughs> today's topic we're basically going to talk about weather right and it, how it relates to training and self-defense correct yeah it's kind of interesting timing because today is just it's miserable out i don't know how it is by you and in, in, uh indiana but it's it's like the weather i i, I hate the most it's it's like 30s and raining you know i'd rather have it drop a few degrees in snow. I mean, a lot of people hate snow because they got, you know, obviously shovel and whatnot. But to me, this is like the worst, man. It just, you know, it soaks you to the bone and it's freezing. I mean, maybe a little yeah. bit more wind would be horrible, but this is the worst. Is it? Is it bad by you? Yeah, it's kind of the same way. It's cold and rainy. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm, I, I'm I like hate you. that. I, I like the snow and I like training in the snow. I'll tell oh, I, I, I guess that you're hitting on the subject that we were supposed to talk about. I think I got my video fixed. I hope it's not a problem with my camera because that's my new camera. And I, I, I'm, I'm wondering if there's a problem with the HDMI output. I hope that isn't the case because that's not going to get fixed. So you guys are talking about training in the weather? Yeah, exactly. Kind of yeah. broaching into the topic. We used to, I used to talk about this a lot. And I used to tell a lot of people that, you know, you train so much in the gym and you know especially with not just grappling but you know striking anything when you're on your feet in 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 the weather that we live in the midwest or other areas of the country or the world where you have snow and icy conditions or even rain or whatever you, what you know what have you uh the landscape plays a big role <laughs> and you know a lot of people when, when they meet me, that's one of the things they always talk about is, yeah, Tony, you were the guy who was talking about, you don't want to go to the ground in a snowbank, man, you'll get suffocated or whatever, or this and that. Yeah. Uh, you know, nothing, nothing worse than getting knocked to the ground or going to the ground, or, you know, something happening to you, whatever it is that you don't expect. And when you're, when you're fighting it, if you're on an icy ice thing or something, you know, your icy patch or something and you slip, you're not even knocked down. You just do it to yourself, perhaps. Oh, boy, you know, you're not mentally prepared for that, you know. Um, and, yeah, it's very difficult. And I'm, I've always been a firm believer uh, that you need to train in the environment that you're going to be in. See, for me growing up, it was really no big deal because I never I never was in a gym, you know, learning. I mean, boxing I was, but learning the, 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 the wrestling, the catch wrestling and the fighting, no. So, um, yeah, I think that's a big thing for everyone. Um, your clothing makes a huge difference too. what you're wearing will 
you know, could really hinder you. Um, it could restrict you uh, and so on. And uh, in certain times it could help you too. Uh, but yeah, you need to train not regularly, but at least often enough that it be you become very familiar with it. So when it's cold outside, go outside. When it's snowing, you know, go outside. When it's raining, train in the rain. Train at night. You know, train in different areas in your vehicle, you know, or wherever. L learn, learn all the different landscapes. Do you guys understand what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it can be I surprising, man, like the cold, how much it affects you. Like my motor skills, we've, my band has played out just in October, you know, when it's like maybe in the high 50s. And your fine motor skills, like your ability to play an instrument, you know, your hands start to diminish there if, you know, when it's cold like that. And it, I'm sure it affects, you know, even larger motor skills, like when you're fighting. Oh, absolutely. I mean, there's just no question about it. And then you have to worry about pulling muscles and so on. And that's just even, hey, you know, even in, in normal weather, you know, if you're not warmed up and you just start to make a move on somebody, one, two, three, you could, you could do something to yourself. You know, um, they don't talk about it, at least not like they used to when, when I was a young man in boxing, how you would see boxers come to the gym, uh, step into the ring and they already had a little sweat on them. Okay. They were already warmed up and that was a sign that they were, they were doing what they had to do. Um, and many times, the commentator, if, if, if one of the fighters was kind of dry, you know, eh, you know, this guy's not really warmed up, you know, so that's an important thing to you to, to bear in mind, but for real learning how to fight out in the weather. Uh, and especially, like I say, being out here in the Midwest or up North or wherever the, the bad climates are. Yeah. It is a huge difference. Um, yeah. I just think a lot of people take, take stuff for granted <laughs> you have the opportunity go outside just just work outside and say well man i don't want to do this <laughs> right yeah i i've had the um advantage of having to be outside every day for work so i guess to some most people that would be a disadvantage but i guess in this scenario it works for me because i'd I know what it's like. I know the, the, the problems you're going to deal with in the extreme weather and I've already dealt with it. And I'm, you know, I'm familiar with it to most people it would be a shock to the system, especially the extreme cold or the extreme heat. But I always enjoy doing my workouts outside. Even, even when I had, even before COVID way before that, when I had access to really nice gyms, I would do my workouts outside. I'd go, I'd go running, go lift some logs, maybe do some pull-ups, do push-ups. Um, and, and I love running in the snow. And I think it builds, to some degree, some grit and, and maybe mental toughness. Because a lot of the time, like you're out in the extreme cold, you're fighting with your mind the whole time, just dealing with the cold. Your mind's telling you it's too cold, you need to go warm up. You know, all, all kinds of stuff is going through your head. And, and it takes more... I guess, determination to really get through a good workout and you, and you feel invigorated. I, I mean, I can't say enough about it. I like training in, in the cold and in the heat. Well, I did a lot of training outdoors as well as, as a kid, you know, um, growing up because yeah, I, we didn't have the facilities, uh, naturally in the winter when it was bad out, we, we, you know, we'd come in indoors, but Still, yeah, I walked to school all the time. So, yeah, I was like you not – I wasn't out in the weather eight hours a day like you are, Nico. But, uh, yeah, I walk into and from school. And plus the, the torture of the, – yeah, that's where we were most likely to get beat up and jumped, you know, is by adults as kids, you know, going to and from school. So, yeah, uh, yeah, I'm a big believer in that. Uh, and I think that's another thing. I've talked so much about this, you know, that you're at a – most schools just don't do it. Uh, now, I have seen, like down by the lakefront, uh, you know, in Chicago and, and probably other places, but I've seen it down at the lakefront. They would do Tai Chi or some, you know, martial arts in the park. That's fine, but that's, you know, that's not what we're talking about here. We're, we're talking, I mean, that's still a safe, uh, you know, grassy, nice summer day. You know, it's now not a big you don't have to adapt as much. 
um, just your footwork. You you have to watch how you move your feet. Um, and that's probably something I don't know if I discussed this on. I don't recall if I mentioned this on my fund uh, foundations of footwork video on that video or not. But you know, uh, you wear in like a boxing ring and a wrestling match. You wear shoes specific for the surface that you're working on and your footwork in boxing it's more like a cat you know you don't want to really land on your heel you want to land on your toes and you want to place yourself and when you're in the street you have to watch because if there's just something there if it's a sidewalk that's cracked or there's a, a, a you know like a groove in the grass or something you can get you can stumble okay you can get hooked up on that you know, uh, think about everywhere you fight, MMA, anything, it's, it's, a, it's a smooth surface, right? So, you know, if you are training in nice weather, even out in the grass somewhere, you know, be, be aware of that. Move around. See how you'll, you would adapt to the different contours of planet Earth because it's there. Uh, and, then, and, of course, if you're going to grapple and you land hard on a, on a rock, on a stone, on a brick or something, on a curb, you know, all of a sudden, quickly, you're going to realize, boy, this isn't uh, this isn't like it was in the gym. Yeah, it's a it's a whole different world. Have you did any training outside like that, Joe, in the in the inclement weather? Because you should have, because I've talked about it. Well, even like like prior to like getting back in training with you, you know, I kind of had like a, a cycle of training where during the winter I would kind of get more indoors. So I do my calisthenics indoors, or I I would focus more on lifting. Uh, during the like crappy winter months and invariably my cardio would fall off you know you just I couldn't get the miles in you know I could jump rope or do other things but it was never exactly the same and so I'd kind of there was a couple of years where I I just kind of said okay I'm gonna you know people are out there running I'm gonna commit to at least keeping up some type of running so I did there's been a few times where I've run throughout the winter not as many miles as I would let's say during the spring and summer um, but I just kind of always hated that you know, in the spring, I'd be starting almost from scratch, you know, and so I'd feel like the first several weeks, you know, I wouldn't even be anywhere near where I want it to be, you know, and that's, that can be kind of, uh, you know, discouraging. So I'm like, well, I want to always keep a minimum up. But one of the things I noticed, and this is kind of a, maybe a, a question is, you know, obviously, like Nico, from his job, he's pretty acclimated to being outside all the, for a lot of, you know, a lot of the day. But for people who are not, like if you're thinking about, okay, I'm going to start doing this. So like for my instance, I had a path that I would run in my house or in my neighborhood where it was like one mile there, one mile back. And so I could get two miles in and literally um, it was almost like, unless it was like one of those polar vortexes, I, I would be dressed up enough. The actual, I would be warming up and I wouldn't actually, the cold wouldn't hit me. You know, it wasn't until, you know, cause the heat of the exercise, but I did find that like over time, like, let's say if I was getting closer to four miles, then I was outdoors long enough that even though I was exer exercising, the cold was catching up to me. So like the duration of the time you spend out there, I guess there's multi, I'm making some points too, is that duration of time out there obviously is a factor, but also like, you know, you, I think you should build up to it too. Like, you know, don't expect that you're going to have a full 90 minute workout session right away if you haven't been doing this and maybe say okay i'm gonna spend 20 minutes doing some calisthenics you know um and see how that feels and kind of build up from there especially with cold weather because i yeah it's it's just it's interesting the variables and how my body i noticed my body having different effects depending on the amount of time i was out there yeah you start to sweat and then the wind hits you you know after so much time of being covered with sweat your clothes get saturated and that's when the wind hits you and you start to freeze after a while. And that's, I mean, that's just something I learned how to deal with. I had to work on the high rises and you had about 40 mile an hour winds blowing at you nonstop. So, and when you're very active working, you're constantly sweating, but uh, that's something that happens, you know, later on, you know, throughout the day, the sweat starts to freeze. So that's something that, that could be a real shock to the system. Yeah. And when it evaporates off of you, you know, you, you get a, what's called a Delta T and ideally it's a 10 degree, perfect Delta T. So you're, you can sometimes get cool. I mean, that's what it's all about. That's what, you know, it's our built-in air conditioner. Uh, 
but yeah, but just even doing the techniques, learning how to fight, learning how to, how you're going to throw a good power punch, how you're going to do a takedown, you know, your shot or whatever, uh, how you're going to grapple, how, you know, this and that, there's so much, you know, uh, yeah, these are things that you, you have to try and you have to, uh, you know, it, it'll be an eye opener for many people. And, and, and it, one of the biggest things for a lot of people it will be the fact that they'll, they'll I don't want to get into it when I'm outside, you know, I don't, you know, I, I want to walk away. Let, let me try to talk it down. Let me talk this bad situation down if possible, because yeah, it, there's so many variables in, in a street fight. Um, it's a fascinating thing that I, pre, I basically made that my life's research is, is, you know, real world violence. And, 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 and just, this isn't necessarily violent, but it's, it's part of the training of being outdoors and knowing what to expect. You know, um, a lot of things can, can, can happen. A tree can be used against you. Uh, a parked car can be used against you. You know, when you're not used to, you know, look at, Hey, for example, take a look at just any random MMA match. Okay. I'll just, I'll just use that because that's a lot of grappling there and it's in a cage invariably guys are going to get laid up up against that cage or, or whatever the platform is. Uh, now imagine not going up against that, but going up against something else. Okay. A, a car and in, in the side view mirror or being manipulated. And instead of going up against the cage, you are now pushed down a flight of stairs. That could be not just fight over. That could be life over. Okay. These are things to, that you have to deal with. Um, so where in an MMA match, you probably wouldn't, you know, if the guy's got, got, a, you know, got, got the jump on you and he's going to push you backwards. Well, you're, you're not worried about that because you know, you got to go up against that cage. You're going to be okay. You can work from there. But in, if there is no cage, you know, what are you going to do here? Okay. You're going down one way or the other. Okay. And if there's a flight of stairs behind you, you got to think quick about dropping. If, you know, if you can't break free, you've got to drop. You've got to stop before this guy sends you down a flight or two flights or however far it is or over the edge of, of a balcony or something. These, these are things that have to be thought of, okay? So naturally, you may not think of, oh, I'm going to train today in case somebody throws me over a balcony. Well, no, that's not what I'm talking about. But you got to train so like, okay, what if, you know, there is no wall to stop this, you know, I'm not going to go up against a wall here to prevent anything bad from happening because we're going to be out in the open where there could be a cliff or something like that. So you're training in your gym. In, if you're doing this, even indoors, you have to kind of uh, imagine what it would be like going outside. Okay. Uh, and you have to broaden your mind. You got, you just gotta, you gotta start seeing these things. So uh, many people don't. <clears throat> and, you know, when, when the real fight happens, all of a sudden it's like, wow, I never would have thought that would have happened. Yeah, well, it did. Yeah. It seems, oh, go ahead, Nico. Seems like everything slows down and hurts more in the cold weather. And then oh, with cold the, weather? Yeah. But I guess when your adrenaline's going, you may not feel, you may or you may not feel pain as much, but um, every surface feels harder. Like even if you hit the, hit the concrete on an icy day, as opposed to hitting the concrete in a, in a warm weather day, it feels a lot different. And that's happened to me before. I hit the concrete on an icy day and it's, it's a lot more solid. Oh yeah. I mean, not to sound childish, but think about the snowball fights, you know, and every so often you'd have a wise guy to put a rock inside that snowball. Okay. Well, you know, this, these are, th you know, you really have to think about all of these things, you know, the, there's so many potential, potential improvised weapons, even outside, you know, a branch off of a tree or this or that something, you know, somebody can grab something, you know, uh, that that you just don't have when you're indoors and yes the weather makes a 
a huge difference. And conversely, let's flip this to these people that live in like Arizona or Nevada or, or someplace else where it's hundred plus degree weather, you know, you get to be, if you're not in good condition to begin with, even if you are in good shape to begin with, but you know, you don't want your, you don't want to end up having a heat stroke, you know, uh, have an elongated situation under that punishing sun and heat. So everything, you know, we tend to want to train in pretty close to ideal conditions. And that's one of the beautiful things and sad things that we no longer have the old tool and die in stone park because those conditions were anything but pristine. They were pretty close to being like outdoor type of scenarios, you know, solid concrete, steel and iron all over the place, you know, uh, metal shavings and, you know, you name it, we had it, no heat, no air. So, you know, that was pretty rugged. Um, but yeah, training in different kind of weather, training in the different kind of material that you're wearing, clothing that you're wearing, uh, is really important, you know, and another thing now you don't, it doesn't have to be cold out to be sick, but what if you're sick? What if you just don't feel good? You got, you think you're coming down with something, the cold, the flu, something. Now you're going to be able to defend yourself under those conditions. Now, these are just, it's just food for thought. You know, I'm not trying to tell people to go out there and train now with their partner while, when you're sick and end up infecting somebody, but these are just things for you to think about. And you have to make ulterior or uh, alternative, uh, you know, plans for how to defend yourself. You know? So, Tony, what do you say to the guy that's like, well, I don't need to defend myself. I got a gun. <laughs> Well, you got to get to your gun, number one, okay? And, and number two, uh, don't miss. So that'd be the second thing I'd say. And number three, you better have a good lawyer, okay? Because, you know, when are you going to draw that gun? At what point are you going to draw it? Are you going to draw it because the guy, the perpetrator, or, you know, whatever, said something, um, motioned in such a way? You know, what, what, when are you going to capitulate and say, okay, I'm just going to draw on this guy. Now, I'm not here to say don't ever shoot somebody. I'm not here to say shoot somebody. I'm not a judge or jury. And you have to be there. But the point is, you know, you're there's going to – this is not like popping somebody in the face, you know, or even choking somebody out and then getting out of there, okay? If you shoot somebody – um. Odds are you're going to get caught. Okay, some of you, you know, this is a serious matter. Uh, and, you know, now you got to deal with all of that as well. But, you know, Nico, the one thing I've learned in not just coaching, but just in life, there's certain people you just can't tell them anything. They're going to just do what they have to do. Uh, I don't want to be that guy that has to, to worry about an external weapon. I want to be the weapon. I want to. I want to be able to deal with you. And I've said it before on this show uh, that as many times as I got jumped in Cleveland and invariably they had weapons. And even when it was multi assailants, they had weapons. And I never once said, you know, damn, I wish I had a gun or I wish I had a pipe or whatever it was that they had. I always said, damn, I just wish they did, if they didn't have these weapons, you know, my whole take on it was I, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, you know, empty hands and let's let you're not, they're not, it's going to be a bad, long, hard day for them. So that's just my philosophy, but other people want to rely on the gun or whatever the weapon is. And again, if that's what they want to do, that's fine. But there may come a time when you don't have it. You don't have that weapon and you have to rely on you. For me, if I had a weapon, it's just, it's dessert. It's just, you know, extra. It's all good. I would not want to have to rely on it. I want to rely on me. So I think, I think a lot of times people don't have time to get to a weapon too. A lot of people that are like skilled with attacks, they don't let you know it's going to happen before it happens. And when it does, it's already, you know, it's too late. The engagement has began. You don't have time to go reach for a weapon in some cases. So, but I think a lot of people think their gun is going to help them with any kind of scenario. 
invincibility so, yeah. yeah well i mean all you have to do is is watch some video clips of even law enforcement you know that uh under pressure now i'm not saying gun a gun drawn situation already but under pressure trying to reach for your weapon while you're being assaulted is not the easiest thing to do okay because first and foremost you got to defend yourself you got to cover up and make sure that you don't get knocked out or you know taken out some way or another so going for the gun let's say the gun going for that weapon uh makes you a bit vulnerable and you got to make sure you can get it and you need to practice under stress situations you know uh how how you can reach for it uh yeah there's as i said you i care about me i want to be the weapon i want the guy to worry about me uh and that's that's the way it is you know and i'm not sitting here saying i'm i wouldn't pick up a club or i haven't picked up something but i already have the situation well in control um i i just i'm with you on that nico whereas you know people who just think this is my ace in a hole this i'm gonna not even an ace in a hole they think just the opposite this is my frontline attack is the weapon that i carry uh you, you i hope i hope it works out for you because if it don't you're in, you're in trouble and and there's you know it's happened where a lot of people ended up having their weapon turned against them yeah and it's not an either or i think that that's the thing is that you can be trained and be and a lot of guys are they're proficient with firearms but they also learn to defend themselves empty-handed yeah. and um they complement each other actually and there's also to me there's a kind of a thing of um escalating force right it's to me when you're going to the gun you're you're, you're taking someone's life or you know threatening them but you know like what if i'm at a party and just a buddy of mine's drunk and for some reason there's a misunderstanding i don't want to have to pull a gun on him you know like i don't want to have to go to the nuclear option right away i want to, i would like to have skill sets to like hey maybe i can contain this guy or get him to the door you know there's, it's not always that we're life or death you know sometimes you have to use these skills in other scenarios um so having those tools it just gives you more options too I mean, or like, what if you're at the beach? I mean, there's all, if you're just, it's to me, it just takes some imagination to realize there might be times when you might not have, you know, access to a weapon um, and you're going to have to defend yourself. And I, you know, I'm a civilian, obviously, but I think probably a lot of people in law enforcement would agree with me that, you know, a lot of them probably could use some more training too. So they would be less inclined to go for their gun right away. If they were more confident in their footwork and their grappling skills, maybe they, you know, things can be de-escalated, de you know, I mean, they, they have a lot more confrontations like that. So to me, um, yeah, just having their gun or just saying, I just have my gun is almost an excuse or kind of a, a rationalization, uh, not to deal with something, not to, not to have to deal with a, something that could be a reality in life. I, I agree with you, Joe. And I think, I actually think somebody that doesn't know how to fight at all and is just relying on a gun, is it a person that's a danger to society, in my opinion? Because, and, and as well as a, a law enforcement police officer, I think a lot of people get shot unnecessarily because the people are scared. Uh, I think fear has a lot to do with it. If somebody has no idea how to fight and uh, they're totally helpless and they're getting confronted by somebody, they might be more inclined to pulling that gun and shooting than somebody that actually knows how to fight and knows what they're doing. That person is going to be way less inclined to picking up their weapon. And this, I think the same applies with police. I think a lot of people get shot unnecessarily because the cops are afraid and I think a lot of these guys don't know how to fight. So they're more inclined to pull out their gun and shoot. Well, I can't speak on behalf of all the police officers out there, but I will know I can just common sense will tell you if you don't know how to fight and you have a gun, you know, you, you also, I mean, I would just think I, I've never been in the situation because I know how to fight, but you would have to worry about the bad guy getting your gun. So now that probably even gives you more, uh, inclination to use it so yeah it, it's not a win situation i don't think there's any shortcuts 
you know, I, I do believe first and foremost that you absolutely need to develop your mind power first, your mind. Second thing is your vocabulary. You need to learn how to psychologically, you know, keep, keep your wits about you and try to deescalate the situation. And when I say that, I don't mean a 10 minute, you know, you're not going to get into the head of a guy, uh, you know, but what you can do is get in your own head. You just need to assess things, calm things down. But then third, you have to have the goods to back it up. You've got to be able to, to fight, you know, uh, you know, empty handed, let's call it. That to me has to be your baseline there. Uh, you, you, you just do, uh, I'm sorry, but you do. And, you know, we're not talking about crazy or, you know, like war situations where you have to worry about a sniper picking you off from a mile or so away. Uh, you know, we're, we're talking about in a civil society here, you know, you, you really have to go through those stages of controlling your mind, controlling the, the, the scenario, trying to deescalate if possible. And then three, being able to manipulate and end this quickly and with, with as little damage to yourself as, as possible. You know, it's, tr trust me, I have a lot of experience in this. This is the way to do it, you know? You know, and like the person who says, well, you know, I've got my gun, so I don't need to spend time training. I mean, I think, you know, obviously it seems to me like they're trying to avoid what it's, it's kind of like someone trying to avoid having to, I don't know, do some other responsibility. Like, yeah, oh, I know I should floss or I know to me, conflict is a part of life. And it's, you know, we're very fortunate. Most of us that, you know, physical conflict uh, doesn't happen very often, but if it does, I, I think it's a universal skill. It's just a part of life. You know, I, I've heard, I've probably said it before on this podcast, but uh, it's just kind of a de denying a reality of existence that unfortunately this happens. And it's, it's just like to me, knowing CPR or knowing how to use a fire extinguisher. I mean, emergencies come up and you need to have at least some familiarity. Like I said, um, I think I heard, I've, other self-defense guys have used the analogies like, yeah, you don't have to be a firefighter, but you should know how to, you know, be able to put out a grease fire in your kitchen or whatever, you know, you need to know some basics, you know, how to, um, and that's just part of life or how to change a tire on a car. I mean, these are just, um, I mean, I think a lot of guys who listen to us follow it to kind of take it to the next level. I mean, I think we have a deeper uh, interest in the, in the martial arts, but I think uh, even if you're just kind of casually worried about your own self-defense, uh, yeah, just to deny the reality that you, you may have to do it empty handed, you know, sometime is, 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 you know, is got to question the psychology of that. that I think you're avoiding something. Um, well, it's a substitute, you know, yes. The, and, and if you are going to pack, and use, you need to practice. You need to shoot. You need to practice your draw. You need to practice shooting under, under stress situations and different types of uh, scenarios. I mean, you really have to, you can't just buy the gun and go to the, go and go to the range and just, you know, sit there like this. That's nothing. You know, it's, you don't know what you're going to do unless you're under a pressure situation. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, when you're fighting, when you're training, when you do what we do or what others do, when you're actually sparring, granted, that's not real, but it's far more real than just shooting at an inanimate object, shooting at a paper target, okay? At least when you're sparring, be it boxing, wrestling, kickboxing, whatever, you know, you, you have that interplay. You, you, you kind of get, you, you know, you develop certain tactile instincts and awareness, so whatever it is you're doing, if you, if you, if you want to avoid all of that and just get a weapon and practice the weapon alone, you know, you better make sure that you can get it in a semi realistic scenario. Um, you know, believe me, if, 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 when your life's on the line and I'm talking from experience here, this is not reading in a book. This is experience. You, you don't, you know, you, you, you react differently than, than you probably think you will. Okay. The key is you need to delay your adrenaline dump. Okay. You don't want it happening while it's, while the, while you're in the middle of the, the firefight. Okay. You need to have that. Let's call it a breakdown later. Okay. You need to, you know, so you don't need to have somebody, you don't need to fall apart in the middle of all this, especially if you have a weapon and now you're trying to shoot it and you, you may end up causing, 
some other kind of damage somewhere. Okay. Um, so there's a lot to, there really is a lot to think about. Uh, there, there really is. And uh, I remember as a kid in, in my house, there was a bullet that went through my window. It wasn't a, it, it was a like a misfire. Well, another time uh, there was a bullet on the front of my, uh, my lawn by the curb. You know, there was a sh gunshot gunfight in the street. It was a ricochet bullet. Now, Think about that. If I happen to be outside, yeah, I might have gotten hit with that bullet. See, that's my point. So you as the aggressor or you as the, you're defending yourself, you shoot that gun, you either hit the guy and a bullet goes through him or you miss and it ricochets and hits somebody else. Yeah, you know, you you're on the hook for that, you know, uh, and, you know, you may win in court, but you got to go to court. You got to live with the fact that, oh, my goodness, what what did I do? There's a lot more to it, okay? It, there really is that people sometimes don't look at. And I may not have looked at any of that if I wasn't thrust, you know, wasn't thrust into that kind of a world. You know, I think I mentioned that one of the kids I went to grade school with, you know, I think he was the first or maybe the second kid to die. And he got killed in a bar situation. He wasn't even involved in the bar fight. He was just sitting there and he got hit in the head with a ricochet bullet, killed him instantly. You know, somewhere off of 55th and St. Clair in Cleveland. You know, uh, that's a shame. But it happens. You bring up a really interesting, uh, a good points about firearms is it's not a simple thing. I mean, your training should be as um, rigorous as it is for empty handed. I mean, there's a lot of things to, like you said, I mean, if I've got, you know, you have to know what type of uh, caliber bullets you have and I, like i said i don't i this is all, i've only read a little bit up on this but you know i could shoot through a wall and hit someone on the other side there's penetration issues i mean there's all kinds of things to be concerned about i mean if it, we talked about actually earlier it was kind of actually circles back to us talking about the environment if i'm in a low light situation i hear a noise in my house right you know and i go downstairs you know if i'm flinching and shooting i mean that's you know if I have loved ones in the house, there's a lot of things. It, it, it's as complex of a situation or should be taken as seriously just as we do with our hand-to-hand -hand combat, if not more, because it's obviously in a lot of ways more lethal in a much quicker time. You know, a, 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 quit, a wrong flinch or reaction could uh, change lives, you know, very quickly. So um, yeah, you bring up a, a good point that ricochets, all, there's all kinds of variables. So it's not just buy a gun, have it. Um, it's to me, it seems like a lifetime commitment of learning and training to be able to use something. I mean, it's a huge responsibility um, and needs to be respected and invested in because, yeah, if that's definitely something you don't want to go south if you're going to involve that in a conflict. Right. And we don't need to get into it because there's the, here. The, this is the thing where I, I, I think people, some people tend to go off on tangents. And it's always that famous what if or what about. OK, you can what if and we could never end the show. OK, they'd have to feed us intravenously. We could talk around the clock about what ifs. All I'm all I'm saying is see the bigger picture. Be aware of, you know, potentially, you know, what can happen. You, you can't cover everything, but just potentially what can happen. And a lot of people don't think that way. You know, what, what, you know, you could say, you know, your gun can jam or whatever. You, you could start going off on things. Um, the point is, with empty hands, to a degree, you have a little more control. Like, you know, if I want to just throw a body shot, I could probably throw a body shot, you know. But even with that, you don't know what can happen. You can hit a guy, knock him down, not, uh, hit him. He could fall, hit his head and die. That happens with alarming regularity. Okay. Now, you're, you may be looking at a manslaughter charge at best. Okay. Who knows? Uh, so yes, when you, when you enter into any kind of situation in the street, it, it can become lethal for one way or the other. Okay. And are you prepared for all of that? That that's the thing. I mean, I, I knew a guy, he was a friend of Kevin's, but he became a friend of mine. He passed away. So I'll just say his first name, Richard. And he was old. He was Kevin's age. 
So he was roughly old enough to be, you know, I was like 18, 19, 20 years older than me. But one day, Rich got a DUI. So Kevin was like, oh, geez, man. You know, Rich is like, I ain't worried about it. No, no. He says, no, no. He says, I, he says, was, I, was, I was wrong for what I did. He says, but I prepared for all of this. He says, I have money stashed aside specifically in case this would ever happen. He says, I knew that it, it, it may. And I have money set aside. I already have, a, you know, I talked to a lawyer. I know who I'm going to and all of that jazz. He says, and, 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 and Richard learned his lesson. After that, he never drank, never, you know, never drove, you know, he never did a drink and drive again. Okay. But he was actually prepared for it. Um, how many people are prepared for the aftermath of a life-threatening situation? If you survive and now all of a sudden you're the one who's being questioned. How many of us are really literally prepared? Do you have money for a retainer for a lawyer? Do you even have a lawyer that you can talk to? Uh, I don't want to get into too many details, but one time I had a one, one of the lawyers that I use just for a traffic situation thing. I, I started talking to him, just, just talking to him about an escalated scenario. And he's like, well, man, I never, I never handled a murder case or anything like that. Well, there you go. You know, you're not going to go to Peter Francis Geraci for something like this, right? You're not going to call the, you know, the, uh, what are, what are those new two guys that are out there always doing those commercials for, you know, uh, personal injury and shit, you know, you, you, you may have to get a special lawyer and, uh, you know, it's going to cost you money to defend this case. So you have to be prepared for all of that stuff. Yeah, there's a lot to it that people just don't think, you know, and then you may lose your job. Damn. There's a lot to it, man. I think using an armed weapon should be the very, very last case self-defense scenario. Um, and I guess the point I was making earlier is I think you, you have to have a pr uh, proportioned response. So if somebody punches you in the face, you don't shoot them, you know, and that's, and that's my point. I, I don't think it's wrong. I think everybody potentially can be packing a weapon that they know how to use. And, that, and that's, that's fine, but they should not be more inclined to use it, especially if they've never exposed themselves to any self-defense scenario. I think we should get a lawyer on here for real. I think we should get a lawyer one day in the future here and just, just have him or her discuss this. And of course, I'm sure where you live makes a difference because different parts of the country have different rules, stand your ground rules and things like that. But, you know, I don't really want to start talking about the law because I'm not qualified to do that. I can only tell you based on what, what I know, and I'm not a uh, professional lawyer or anything, but psychologically it's always been about me i wanted to be the toughest guy in the world i wanted to know that i can handle the situation and here's the thing if you know going into it in a fair fight that you don't stand a chance then you're you're in trouble so you you've got to get your skills to a point where you know that in a fair fight you can hold your own against anybody in the world okay and very few people can say that and that's all I cared about was being able to live that, live that. And uh, I've been blessed. I was lucky. I had the training and I put the time into it. You know, I had the proper coaching and I had the skills shown to me and I adapted to it. But that's the goal to shoot for first. No pun intended. But that's what you need to go for is to get as much physical skills as you can. Because also – a lot of fights, like you just said, Nico got getting punched in the face or punched in the nose or whatever. A lot of this is boiling down to like an ego thing. Okay. Uh, and if you're comfortable in your skin and in your, in your own masculinity, now I'm not talking about getting, getting mugged here or anything, but just some loud mouth, you know, that you could just flick him and he's done. If you really know it, you should be able to impart that impression on him. And believe me, all it takes is maybe sometimes you just standing the right way or just throwing one punch, just, you know, just to, 
and this guy gets hit with a straight jab, a good stiff jab, he's going to know right away, uh oh, <laughs> I think I picked the wrong guy here. So sometimes that's all it takes, man. Or or verbs, verbal verbiage. You could just say the right things, but you got to be have you got to back it up, man. And that's where the crux of this is, for the people who who think that there's a way around learning how to fight. Uh, there really isn't, because fighting and having that ability to fight is more than just using that ability to fight. It's it changes the way you carry yourself as a man or as a woman, it empowers you in, in many ways and in, in other avenues of life, you know, to, to know that you have this ability, kind of like a doctor, when a doctor would, would be out in public, he, if, if somebody is having a heart attack or choking and people in the crowd may panic, that doctor is going to be cool, calm, and collected. Not even a doctor. Could even be, you know, a lot of paramedics are phenomenal. They they know what to do. Now, they may be restricted or handcuffed by laws, but let's just get that out of the way. Forget about the laws. They've been there, done that. They know that they can handle this. And so they walk around with that kind of sense, no, not, no matter where they're at. There's, there's just like this strength of having this kind of knowledge and this ability. And when you can fight, you 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 know really fight, not this bullshit fight, but you know that you are super elite. Man, it gives you you can sleep good at night, I can tell you. Well, yeah, there's all kinds of interactions that are not even I mean, I think most guys are in situations even like at work or whatever where people will try and physically intimidate you. They you know, it's never gonna be anything, but you know, they just try and use their presence or their size. You know, and, I'm, and I imagine women even much more so, you know, they always talk about all these women who are being harassed all the time. But if, you know, on the, I mean, to your point, I guess, is saying having that confidence in yourself, it does change how you carry yourself in all those situations. You know, like in my workplace, I'm not too worried about anybody, you know, so, someone wants to get upset with me or whatever, you know, I, I'm not too worried about how they're going to, you know, get in my face. Okay. You, you, I know however they want to escalate it, you know, I'm, I'm prepared for it, you know, where I'm, I know a lot of people that I run into probably in the very back of their minds have to be worried about that. What if this really goes all the way, you know? And I think, um, so that I think is a big plus for having that confidence in yourself. And I know, I know for myself, it's definitely something I want for my kids. I mean, I, I try and work out with them when I can, it's, but just, yeah, like I said, I think it's psychologically healthy to be, to know that you can be safe and, and confident. And, and that's just, I, yeah, it, it doesn't always have to be uh, a mugging or an assault, although obviously that's what you really need to be ready for. But I think just going from, you know, through your daily life quite often, that physicality is, it changes who you are. Well, let me give you the flip side <clears throat> because my whole life I've had my, you know, the guys that I would rat around with, and they always knew in the back of their mind that if shit hit the fan, Tony's here to take care of it. And I hated that. You know, I just didn't like that. I didn't, I felt like many times that I was being, you know, used. Okay. They'd run their mouth and they'd say things that I know that they wouldn't say if I wasn't there. Okay. Because they know that I, I got their back, you know, and in other times, you know, my friends were just victimized. And I had to stand up and tell the guys or the guys that were picking on them, you picked on the wrong guy. Okay. Now let it go. So with your knowledge comes responsibility. Okay. So just know that there will be people who will count on you. And there are times when, you know, if there's times when you just have to say no, if you're, especially if your pal's in the wrong, that's when your verbal skills really need to come into play kind of talk things down. We discussed this when we were talking about being a bouncer. Now you really want to kind of diffuse things if you can and make everybody just take it down a notch. But you know, when you have to go, when it's, when it's time to throw down, you, you, you know, you're going to have to do it. Especially if, you know, your friend or your loved one or whoever you're with is incapable of defending themselves. What are you going to do? You're going to be like that doctor. that is just going to let your friend choke to death. 
because you're just too tired to, to do the Heimlich or whatever it is that needs to be done? No. See, they take an oath. Now, I'm not going to get into the subject of bad doctors and all of that. We're, we're talking Pollyanna here. You know, doctors take an oath. How many martial artists have actually ever taken an oath? Now, I'm, I'm serious. When I was a kid, I knew because of all the things, all the death and everything I saw around me from, from the bullshit, I said, I will never let, if, as long as I can, I will help defend people, total strangers if I have to. I'll be there standing up for them. I'm the guy who bullies the bully. I take them out. That was my oath that I would do that. And I've kept that. I kept my word and it's gotten me in, in, in trouble sometimes, you know, but it's an oath that I took to help the weak. So how many martial artists out there have taken that kind of oath? I don't know. I'm not trying to put anybody on the spot here, but you know, there's oaths to be taken in, 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 you know, and you got to keep, keep your word. I get worked up about that stuff because so many people just are phonies. You know, I don't mean their skill sets and shit, but I just mean their word means nothing. So, yeah. Hey, let's change the subject now because we're getting kind of heavy again. And I, I, what? Go ahead, Nico. I just, I just thought that was good, Tony. I thought that was good at that. I, I, I just think there was a work. saying, there was a saying that, um, I don't remember exactly how it goes, but it was something like a prize fighter. He fights for glory, and uh, but a warrior, he fights for love, for the love of the people around him. And uh, I think I think as men, we have a responsibility to defend those who cannot defend themselves. And I think that should be endowed upon every everyone, every man in society. And I think that's part of the problem with society is there's too many weak men. Well, yeah, there's weak period. Yes, there are. And, and it seems like insults and name calling is the, is the way to go now. You know, now you have the key. Well, and it's been a while now. It's not just now like today, but it's been happening for a long time. Keyboard warriors and this and that. And, you know, I don't, uh, I'm not saying, you know, when we were kids or when I was young, I shouldn't mean kids like grade school, but you know, when I was younger, you know, yeah, you would call names, this or that, you'd insult people, but you know, you know, you did it to their face and if you didn't, it would get back and you have to back that up. Nowadays, there's so many people don't have to ever back it up. Um, but the thing is in pool, shooting pool, especially back in the old days when I was starting out and uh, playing on the road the bar tables had heavy cue balls. They were very difficult to control. And there used to be an expression back then. You draw for show and you follow for dough. And what that meant was because draw shots on those balls were very difficult to do. Follow shots were easier because the cue ball is heavy. So it's inertia. It's rolling forward. So many times you would draw just to show off that you can control that cue ball. Really follow would be the easier shot to do. And I think that's what happens nowadays. The, sh you know, draw for show. That's what people do with their big mouth or they write shit on the internet and they this or that. That's all like show. You know, follow for the dough. Well, what can you really do? I don't want to hear your insults. I don't want to read this stuff. And, you know, it's constant. It's on the news. It's everywhere. I'm tired of that. I walk away from it. I don't want to hear it either keep your mouth shut or say something nice. But, you know, if it gets escalated, you can, you can bring it down if you have to without, I mean, you could swear, you know, but you don't need to try to, I don't know, humiliate or in intimidate because you got to back that up. And you're right, Nico, there's a lot of weak people, but there's a lot of people who are weak that try to, put up this facade of strength and I, those, you know, they're better off just staying in the shadows because they're not helping themselves, um, you know, by, by lipping off and, you know, and antagonizing when they cannot back it up. So 
that's just the way I think about it. Uh, I just, I just don't like doing that. But, you know, Joe, you work in a different, like Nico works out in the uh, works in the, uh, you know, out in the open where he has transient at times, maybe people that could just come up on a work site, on a job site. You're more in an office kind of situation. And, you know, so it's a little different. Me now, I'm basically trapped here taking care of my mom. So I'm not out in the public anymore. So all three of us now come come from different things. But the area that I live in now, uh, in many ways, is, you know, it, it's a different type of violence that you might run into. Out here would probably be a little bit more road rage where I live now, this area. Um, I would think, whereas when in the city, Chicago, where I lived, I mean, I'm not saying there wasn't any road rage. Now you're now Chicago's going nuts with the carjackings and stuff. But when I was there a few years ago, all those, all those 30 years, almost there, uh, 50 years I've lived in the city, Cleveland or Chicago. So, you know, I saw a different kind of violence than what I would see here now, but there's always that underbelly that's always there. I always know that at any moment somebody can snap. So I, I try to be prepared for it. But um, yeah, on another note, I am trying to get off of it now because we've been look, we've been going for 45 minutes or so, maybe longer, maybe an hour. Uh, Nico brought or Joe brought up uh, <clears throat> Weird Al Yankovic and the parodies and you know this and that and you know, that was all about entertainment. You know, he he did those songs to make people, well, probably to get rich, but, you know, to make people happy and enjoy. And somewhere along the way, and Nico will probably jump on this, you know, you, when we were, even before Nico was born or when I was a kid, martial arts started to become entertainment. Okay? Kind of like pro wrestling became, you know, it was all entertainment the real heart of what it was designed for both real catch wrestling here and martial arts got lost. It became more just let me have, let me enjoy watching this. And I don't know, man. Uh, that isn't why I got into learning how to fight. I didn't want to learn how to fight to entertain you. And I didn't play music to have people laugh at my songs. Okay. I wanted people to go ooh and ah when they heard me play. And when I fought, I wanted people to go ooh, ah, uh, ugh, because they're feeling the pain. I never wanted anybody to enter, be ever entertained. Somewhere along the way, it's it's lost its roots in my opinion yeah i feel this would almost be a good topic for a, a whole other podcast i saw some guys post uh, and it was kind of along those lines of of schooling is like have martial arts and they were talking about a particular style uh has it been watered down you know over the last 20 years or whatever you know as it's expanded you know originally it was just honestly a core group of guys who you know you know, fought every day and, you know, and the toughest survived. And, and now it's kind of expanded to strip malls. And, and it's almost like that pattern or that trajectory exists for almost all styles. I mean, if you go back and one of some of the people made comments about, yeah, if you look at some of the karate guys back in the fifties and sixties, some of those guys were hard, tough dudes, you know, they fought bare knuckle, they could break, you know, baseball bats on their shins i mean these were guys who you know whether or not you agree with what they were doing technically they were some hard tough guys but it's it's spread I think out we now. lost joe you there nico oh i'm can you hear me yeah no joe's here i can hear you joe can you hear me uh oh i think we lost tony actually that was it for tony uh <laughs> hopefully we'll get back on but um yeah i mean and i don't know you know, if that's happened for a lot of styles, We're maybe it's frozen in time. Oh yeah. See, he's frozen. His video's frozen. We'll see if he jumps back in, in a second. Um, but, um, 
There you he there, is. Nico? Yeah. Hey, we see you. Hello? Yeah, we can see you. Tony. Well, maybe this is the end of the podcast for the day. Maybe we should call actually, it here. Actually, I think now would be a good time because I got to run anyway. Okay, cool. Well, it was good talking, and I think we'll sync back up with Tony, and uh, obviously we'll be back on next week and look forward to new videos. And, uh, yeah, talk to you guys all later. One. <laughs>